four. Oh, there we go. <laughs> now we're live. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn on this Thursday afternoon. I'm so glad those of you who are joining us are here today. I have a great show for you. Um, before we get started, I would like to ask anyone who's arriving to please like and share this broadcast with others who will be interested. This is going to be a very important conversation about what's ailing our youth, what's ailing our kids, the next generation of Americans. Um, I can't think of a more important conversation. And I'm so honored to have my guest today, Jeremy Adams. Jeremy is the author of the book we'll be talking about, Hollowed Out, A Warning About America's Next Generation. I cannot recommend this enough. You need to get this book. And as an extra added bonus, you get the 1776 report in the back for your own perusal. So you don't have to listen to the talking heads about what it says. Read it for yourself. Make your own decisions. Um, who is Jeremy? You should know. So I'm going to tell you. Jeremy is a high school and university teacher living in Bakersfield, California. He and his writing have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Newsweek, Huffington Post, Washington Times, New Discourses, Quillette, C-SPAN, The Daily Wire, and numerous national education podcasts. And he's written four books, so not just this one. So you're going to want to read all the things that he's written. Um, but we're very lucky to have him with us because it's rare that we get to speak to an actual teacher who has a long history of being in the classroom, loving being in the classroom, and at the same time observing it a little bit removed uh, as a social scientist, you know, documenting what's going on with our kids. So with that said, welcome, Jeremy. Thank you so much for being here. Deb, thank you for having me on. It's an absolute honor to be here. Well, I'm really grateful for you to do for doing this. Um, well, first of all, uh, the book was amazing. Of course, there were so many parts of it where I was going, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to lie to you. There were parts that hit very close to home because I have three teenagers. And hopefully we can talk a little bit about how even the you know, parents with the best of intentions are up against a lot right now in society. Yes. Um, but first, what I would love for you to do for the audience is Explain the concept of being hollowed out. What do you mean by that when you talk about our, our kids in this generation? Yeah, great question. Uh, when I talk about hollowed out, uh, what I'm talking about is essentially the human soul. I'm talking about a human personality. I'm talking about when we talk, you know, when the Greeks talked about human flourishing, when they talked about fulfillment. Uh, when we talk about these grand words like enchantment and grandeur and meaning and purpose in our lives, uh, human beings as traditionally use the same things to fill themselves in. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I get really frustrated by sometimes is that I, I think some of students think that they're unique in the stream of history, uh, that somehow they understand things and they, they see things that nobody else before them has ever felt or seen before. And I guess in this way that the book is, is somewhat conservative in the way that I believe that there are timeless truths. And I believe that there is a, a fixed human nature. And I think that people a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago essentially reach fulfillment in the same basic way. Uh, and that is that, that we find meaningful attachments. Uh, and, and those attachments tend to be intensely personal. Um, we do it through love, you know, eros, uh, finding love in our lives. We do it through friendship. Uh, we do it through scholarship. We do it through uh, uniting to something bigger than ourselves, something transcendent, uh, a faith, a, a belief in something that transcends the, the moment and transcends the individual. Uh, and so when I, I look at the things that traditionally lead to human fulfillment, and again, you can go read the book of Genesis, go read the Sermon on the Mount, go read uh, Aristotle, go read uh, Eastern and Western works. It's the same basic things that, that give us a sense of meaning and purpose. And one of the things I noticed in the last five to 10 years, and, uh, you know, it's weird, Deb, because I'm, I'm in this, you know, the book has been out now for three and a half months. So I'm in a little bit of a defensive posture where you've, you've had enough people that come out and, you know, you listen to what the criticism is and, you know, the criticism is, well, every generation is, is, is thinking that the next one is, is flawed and, and frail. Um, and, and what I would say is that that's different because I've taught long enough. Um, I've taught 24 years. Now, I know I look young and vibrant and I look like I'm only 30 years old, but in fact, I've been teaching for almost a quarter of a century, Deb. And so I can tell you things are different, right? Things in the last five to 10 years, there has been a profound and colossal pivot in the lives of our young people and the way they look at these traditional anchors of meaning. And that's why 
I'm so passionate about the book and I will take every sling and every arrow that comes my way and will happily absorb it so that I can be on shows like this to tell people this isn't like every generation and it's very recent. And so it, the concept of hollowed out is the things that traditionally fill us in and make us feel a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. It is not there for our young people. And it is a broad assortment. It affects every racial and economic and religious demographic. It is not just for poor kids or rich kids or people of color or, or, or Asian kids or, or, or Christians or atheists. It's all of our children are experiencing this kind of poverty of the soul, if you will. It's hollowing them out. And it's very recent. And you know what? It's the adults. It's not the kids. The kids have no control over the time in which they're being born. So, you know, the, the traditional criticism that, oh, you're, you're criticizing the kids. No, I'm criticizing me. I'm criticizing the adults that should know better because we know what are the things that lead to a, a meaningful life. And we're letting a generation grow up without those meaningful attachments and it's hollowing them out. Right. And, you know, in, in the book, you talk about the sort of the influences that contribute to this void sort of, you know, crisis of the soul or absence, whatever, of meaning. And what I found interesting is you you explain very thoroughly the history of the sort of devolution of these traditions and institutions that formally filled us up, whether it was, you know, um, the traditional kind of scholarship where you really dove deep, whether it was the community around which you would organize, you know, churches, community organizations, sports, in-person activities, in-person relationships. And you are, are, you know, explain this has been going on. It's not like we woke up five years ago and suddenly abandoned everything in person or stopped doing these things. This has been a, a more gradual shift. And I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about that. What, you know, because I mean, you cover it in the book, but if you could, for the audience, explain kind of how did we get here? How did we get to this place where we're like, meh? Right. No, I, I, excellent point. Um, and what I would say is, you're right, it's kind of been a slow build. But I would say that, you know, the last two or three years have really, I think there are two things that have really amplified and accelerated and put a spotlight on these problems that you're right. It has been slowly uh, kind of approaching. The first one, of course, is the technology. Uh, is is the fact that you know they already had what I would call a a kind of corrosive individualistic culture. Uh, you know, starting in the 1960s, we became we kind of shifted the tone and the tenor of our culture from one where we said, well, you know, if you're a man or a woman in America, you know, you, you, the expectation is that you you do believe in kind of these you know, universal moral principles. Um, you, you are going to get married, probably. You you are going to go to church. You, you do love your country, even if it's not perfect. There's kind of these expectations that you will attach yourself to something, to a kind of more, what I would call a radicalized individualism. And the the technology that we've given to our young people has really augmented and allowed them to become even more individualistic because now they can create their kind of own digital ecosystem their own enclave, their own kind of hermitage within which they don't have to engage anything they don't want to engage in. Um, you describe and, it as creating their own reality. Yes, absolutely. Where it's, it's not just like, I'm going to cast off the shackles of traditional mores and, and you know, norms and live differently within the same reality. I'm going to create my own reality with my own morality and my own ethics and Right. right, right. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we, we see here is that this radical individualism, you know, I, I think that for the last 40 years, we have really taken for granted, well, of, of course, people are going to be individuals, but in their private lives, they're still going to be domesticated by a sense of right and wrong, right? They're still going to want to have friendships. They're still going to exist within a community that has limitations on their behavior. Um, right. so, so we take the church, we take the school, we take the family. We, I think we've taken these things for granted. And I think all of a sudden, when you have a generation where all of these associations have been removed, where they, where, where essentially they've been extricated, where they, they don't have dinner with their families, th th their view of religion 
is, I mean, again, I'm a public school teacher. It's none of my business what your religion is, but what bothers me is how ignorant they are about the teachings of the world's great religions. They don't know anything about it, and what they think about it is bad and that it's oppressive and that it's judgmental. I mean, we live in this weird metaphysical universe now, Deb, where it used to be that, you know, you, you had the wrong view of something was to believe in something that was immoral. Now the immoral thing is to have any judgment at all. And that tolerance is the highest good. Instead of knowing what's true and moral and just and righteous, now the highest good is just simply to say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. And that anybody who judges what somebody else thinks, they are the ones who are wrong. It's a really weird metaphysical. Well, unless unless they've decided well, along the lines of the postmodernists that you have wrong think according to their tribe, which we're going to talk about in a bit well, too. Right. But uh, perhaps you can explain for the audience because even I had to sit and think about it for a while. The difference between, you know, I call myself an individualist, but when I think of it, I'm thinking of it in terms of my, you know, individual right to pursue my own happiness, happiness, not being a destination or a feeling, but a process of making choices and solving problems that are problems increasingly that I want to solve, not necessarily that I have to solve, but always with an eye towards, you know, life is solving problems. You know, it's never, it's not just, I exist in a state of everything's okay. Right. Wow. And so I would just like to do those things voluntarily and not be coerced. Okay. And I don't want to feel bullied or pressured or whatever by other people who tell me, you know, what I should do irrespective of my values. In other words, when I think back to the founding of the country, I think we were, you know, meant to be free to do what we ought, not free to do any old thing that we feel like, because that would be completely divorced from not only the values of, you know, the enlightenment and all that, but also of human flourishing. Like you could, you can't flourish and just be a hedonist or a nihilist. So, but I think sometimes people hear individualism and they, they think about the way I'm thinking of it. And so then they say, well, what do you mean a radical, what's wrong with individualism? So yeah. can you explain like the difference between Absolutely. what I just described and what they're doing? Right. So when, there, there's a dichotomy here, right? There's a difference when you talk about, you use the phrase individualism, which I think is essentially uh, rocking the cradle of of you know liberty, right? So you're you're free to be the individual that you want to be. But I think there is a kind of generational schism in the way that you and I think about liberty and, and individualism. So in the traditional classical liberal sense of the term, the beauty of America, the beauty of the Declaration of Independence, the beauty of of pluralism is that every human being uh, is different, and we have different tastes and preferences uh, about how we want to spend our time. I mean, really, at the end of the day, the human journey is a problem of time. We don't get that much of it. We don't know when it's going to end. And so what are we going to do with this extraordinary blessing of time that we get? And America was a project born out of this idea that we shouldn't have these false connections to a king that we were born in, you know, loyalty to a king, belief in a church that we don't have any freedom for, we're born into a class. And so America was a project of liberation, right? A project of saying, Individuals should be free to think what they want, go where they want, worship as they please, associate with whomever they want. And because they are freely deciding those things, their lives become meaningful. One of the things I tell my students all the time is that the things that make life meaningful require freedom, right? You look at the three great loves, right? Romantic freedom, you can't make somebody fall in love. You can't make somebody into a friend. You can't make somebody believe in a certain kind of faith. And so what you're talking about is, I'm me because of the way that I use my freedom, right? Nobody else is going to use the, this gift of freedom the way that I use it. And that makes me unique, right? That's but at the same, right. But at the same time, I also know that I'm not really going to be a fulfilled and happy person and be an island. Like, exactly. It, it, I want to be the best me I can be because then I will form good, healthy relationships and I will have, you know, I would like to have a family, you know, so in other words, the things that even I want as an individual are strong connections to people who share my values and, and that sort of thing. That, that's exactly right. And so the difference now is that young people see you and I describing that we, you, we are describing the freedom to do something. They see as freedom as the freedom from anything. So I when see. you and I, we freely become Christians, but that, that attaches us to a, a colossal amount of obligation. Right? right. You and I freely decide to marry somebody. That is a lifetime commitment to something. You and I freely decide to have children. 
wow. I mean, that, that, that's a responsibility right. and duty. So we are connect, we're using our freedom to connect ourselves to things of our own choosing. Young people see that as, as I'm going to choose to be free from any obligation. So that's why there's an aversion to religion. There's an aversion to patriotism. There's an aversion to family. There's definitely an aversion to having children because these are all things that, that tie us down. And, and so I think where you and I say, well, look, yeah, we got to get up in the middle of the night and change a poopy diaper. Yeah, we have to go to a board meeting and fight with a board that we are doing things that we don't believe in because we love our kids. You and I see it as creating meaning in our lives. Yes, I don't want to change the diaper. Yes, I don't want to go to a soccer game. Yes, I don't want to do homework. Yes, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to go do this thing, but my, my faith tells me not to. I want to do these things, but not doing it, right, you know, or connecting, that gives my life purpose. They see it as nothing but obligation. And so why would I tie myself down with all of these difficult things? And so it, it makes me sad because they don't understand that that's the good stuff, right? The things mm -hmm. that bind us are the things that define us for the better. Right. Well, and you talk a lot in the book, too, about the world in which they live, this virtual world, yeah. shows them the finished product, a famous person, a celebrity. And that's a whole other thing you talk about is the cult of celebrity, that being yeah. famous in and of itself, not for achievement or right. accomplishment, but just I'm, I'm well known that you talked about how your students wanted you to get a blue check. Yeah. And yes. when yeah. you, you were denied your blue check, which you found out only verifies that you are you, you're actually Jeremy right. Adams, yeah. the author and teacher. Right. And they were more disappointed in you not getting the blue check than, than anything, you know, whether you deserved it or not or anything like that. And, and that I think is emblematic of what we're dealing with here. Yeah. It, it's funny that you, you say that. So it's been kind of interesting. You know, my other books were all you know, kind of professional development books. So you just, you know, if you're a teacher, you would buy it. But it wasn't a, a quote unquote popular book. It wasn't a commentary book. It wasn't a soapbox book. Um, it wasn't the kind of book you'd want to see as, as a bestseller. And it's interesting that, you know, I'm teaching this. This is the first year I've taught after Hollowed Out came out. And so, you know, you've been on in the radio, you've been in, on national news. I've done all these things that are not normal for just a high school teacher to do, right? Most high school teachers right. don't have all this. And so right. when they want to talk to me about my book, they never, they don't care about the book, right? They, they, they don't, God forbid they ever actually read it right they right. want to know all about the stuff like you know did you really go uh, on fox and friends did you, you right. know, did you really have a, a podcast with newt gingrich did you really do this or do that they don't care at all what the book said what the book said yeah i mean like right. some, somebody said mr adams did you know did you know that you are the first jeremy adams on google i'm like what does that mean they're like well when you search jeremy adams you're like, they, that they thought that was the achievement right. whereas right. for me the achievement was I'm a nobody. I'm just a high school teacher. I spent 20 years working on a writing career. And finally, you know, the book that I think is kind of my magnum opus, my kind of my, right. the height of my professional life. It happened. I'm so excited. And I get, hopefully get to make a difference in, in people's lives. They couldn't care at all about that. It was all the kind of, you know, oh, wow, you got to be on TV yeah. or, or all this. I still don't have a blue check, by the way. Uh, and, yeah. and, that's, and that's okay. That's fine. I, th I think, I, I don't think Charles means your mood. I think he means turn on a light. <laughs> so I was just looking. Yeah, is that, I, okay? that's, is that better? Yeah, that's, I think go. that's better. But I was okay. like, I hope he doesn't mean he's too dark. He's too dreary. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, um, Mr. But, Mr. Optimistic. Yeah. But I, but I brought it up because um, what I've observed is a, you know, what you, you described as um, they don't think the self needs any instruction. Right. So even when, when we were kids and, you know, I, as you point out in prior generations, we all thought, you know, our parents had, you know, we're old funny daddies or, well, they had something to, they're different and we're going to do different things. I don't recall believing that I literally knew all I needed to know. You know, I just felt like I would learn different things or I was going to learn what I wanted to learn and do things my way. And today I feel like they're like, nope, I'm good. I came out of the womb fully formed. And all I need to know how to do is like speak and operate the phone. I'm good. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if you, if you want con confirmation that you're correct, look at the way that we look at college admissions now, right? When we used to apply for college, it was, look, here's the man or woman I'm aspiring to be. I know that I'm not. I mean, here, here's another concept uh, that the Greeks talked a lot about that we never mentioned anymore. And that's the idea of being incomplete, right? That oh, yeah. we have, you know, that we, we, we have the capacity for reason. We have the capacity for pride. We have the capacity for desire, but we don't know how to order it because we're young and we haven't come into contact with great books and, and extraordinary human beings. And so I go to college 
so that I can kind of perfect my nature. I can take this kind of inchoate, uh, raw uh, self and become something greater than what I would be in isolation. And we do that. And that's what education used to be about, right? This idea of, of what can I be? This sense of noble aspiration. And young people, you know, nowadays colleges are like, you are perfect as you are. Uh, and, and, and God forbid we ever make you confront a point of view uh, or a notion that you don't already agree with. I mean, to me, one of the things that disturbs me the most about colleges, and, and I think, you know, all of this, all of the, the ideas, you know, all these critical race theory ideas, they've been out there for decades, right? They've been there, but they kind of stayed, you know, kind of like a, a lab, you know, the virus has stayed in the lab, right? And they've just kind of been there. And I think the difference is in the last five to six years, they've escaped the lab, right? And now 14 year olds who don't understand what they're saying uh, are seeing a watered down version of this on TikTok and, and, and blithely repeating it. Right. What's happening is you don't have that sense that I want to impress my elders. I mean, this is something that when I was younger, I wanted my teachers to be impressed with me. I wanted to impress them. I wanted them to say, good paper, Jeremy. I love your effort. Here's how you can get better. I'll tell you, Deb, my students, they, they see this relationship as one-way traffic. I'm there for them, right? And right. they're not really that interesting in really showing me what they can do because that's, that's not how they see themselves. Um, right. And so they're not incomplete. They're perfect as they are, as you said. And I think colleges have really perpetuated this sense of, you know, expression, right? Instead of trying to, yeah. to, 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 to strive, we express, well, you know what? I don't give a damn what a 19 year old says. You haven't read mm -hmm. anything. You haven't experienced anything. Let's study people. Let's talk to people right. who have experienced things, right. but now just let me express myself and don't condemn right. me and don't challenge me. Well, you said, um, you, you talk about, I'm going to read from this because I can't do it justice. You said they accept often without even thinking about it, that the past is not only irrelevant, but wrong. They accept the postmodern conceit that the self does not need instruction. The modern self needs only validation. And is, this is the key part, not ashamed of seeking satiation. And that's the thing that's missing. I remember saying to, I think it was, I was talking to my dad way before I ever had kids, probably 25 years ago. And I said, we need to bring back shame. And I don't mean like shaming yeah. people with unearned shame. I just meant there you need, we need to bring back a healthy dose of, you should be embarrassed to demand from your elders, you know, kind of approbation for doing nothing, for showing up yeah. and just walking across the room without falling down. And we're supposed to pat you on the head. And I was talking to my husband this morning. I said, you know, what I see is I see sort of three movements that, in, in succession have brought us here. One, the self-esteem movement, which came up in kind of the 80s, right? Like yeah. mid to late 80s of like, here's a trophy for everyone, gold star. Then we had the anti-bullying campaigns where we couldn't hurt anyone's feelings and like everything was abuse and a bully, bullying and kids were not left to their own devices to just cope a little bit more. And I'm not saying that everyone should, you know, the bullying's fine. I'm just saying that when we start adding adults into the mix and triangulating, we added to that feeling that kids need to be constantly validated or else it's bullying by their peers, by their teachers. And then now we're adding the ready excuse of society hates you. Society was set up against you. You can't possibly succeed. If things are not going well for you, it's somebody else's fault. Here are the, here are the somebody else's you can blame. And why would we expect young people when their elders are constantly apologizing to them for life being hard? Why would we expect them to not be shameless about it? So much to say there. So much that I agree with. <laughs> I mean, that's me, just my little no, that, no, no, that, no, no, but let, let me go backwards there. You know, young people are bright. I mean, they're smart. And, and something I, I think we've forgotten is that incentives matter. And young people pick up on incentives. And, you know, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, I think there was this idea that, uh, you know, we looked at people who were quote unquote successful and we saw that they engaged in certain kinds of behaviors. And so we emulated that. We're like, okay, well, that person was educated. They didn't do drugs. They didn't get arrested. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, it's what we, I know liberals hate the idea of a, of success, of a success sequence, but I'm sorry, it's, 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 it's real. Um, right. And so young people today, though, they're like, well, how do I have cultural cachet? How do I have power nowadays? And it's not through achievement, right? You get power, you get cachet, you get followers by outrage by a kind of a kind of noble victimhood uh, where we say well I, 
the world has done me wrong. Therefore, it owes me something. And that's how I'm going to get the thing that I want. So I do think it's interesting. Have you noticed that in the last 10 or 15 years or so, there's almost, I don't want to say it's a war. Maybe that's a little dramatic and hyperbole. But the achievers, the strivers, you know, what Teddy Roosevelt called, you know, the active life, the strenuous life, people who go into the arena and succeed, they're the bad guys now. Right, yes. right, like you know, like Obama's like, and again, I'm I'm not an Obama hater at all, by the way. I probably like him more than most of your audience does. But this idea that you didn't build that, that notion that nobody is really the consequence of their decisions. You you hear a lot of rhetoric from certain political quarters that say if your life isn't good, it's because somebody else is doing something to you, right? The kind of the kind of the populism on the left on the right. Whereas, Just this week, we have Senator Karen, right? We have Elizabeth yeah, Warren. Yeah. Elon Musk is the root of all evil. Please tell me you're kidding. But, but that, but the that, man but, does more in five minutes than you have in your entire career. <laughs> but, but, but this is getting to what you talked about earlier, Deb, which is that, you know, that we have the freedom to make choices. And instead of saying that your life is largely the consequence of the choices you make and instructing young people like this are these are the choices that tend to live to a lead to a full and meaningful and successful life. Instead of doing that, what have we done? We have inculcated an ethic of victimhood and said, you know what? Now you get what you want, not by reaching and striving and using your liberty in a fruitful and meaningful manner. No, 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 no. Now it's through this ethic of the world owes me because it did A, B, and C to me. Now, I'm not belittling the fact that some people do have higher hurdles than others. I teach at an urban inner city, and the stories that I hear from my young people and from the homes that they come from would make your, 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 your blood boil and your skin curdle, right? So people have real hurdles in this society, and I would never deny that. But here's the thing. I see magic every day because I see young people who reject that falsehood that, well, you know, I'm, I'm a consequence of all these, you know, systemic uh, implicit forces that I can't control who reject that and say, no, I have an opportunity to be educated. I have the chance to make good decisions. And by God, I'm going to make that decision. That's You don't need to go to Disneyland to see the magic. You can see it in my classroom when young people make that decision. So you're right. Um, young people are, are smart and they're realizing sometimes that I get power not through achievement and action, but through, through, through claiming that the world owes me something. The other thing I would say that I think you are spot on about is the self-esteem movement. Right. So my parents and my dad was kind of hard on me. My dad, um, I don't want to get emotional. Um, my dad just passed away about three months ago. Oh, um, he, thank you. He was a, an extraordinary teacher. Um, and he was, uh, he was an even better father. Um, and he came from a shack, um, an abusive father. Uh, and he believed in the utility and the majesty of education. And, and because of that, he put a lot of expectations onto me, but I remember that my dad was very clear that like when you have a goal and you work hard and you achieve it, mm -hmm. then you feel good, right? That's right. the time to celebrate. And, and, and this idea that, you know, that, that you work hard, you do the right thing, and then you feel good about yourself. That's the right trajectory, but you're so right. Nowadays, it's the opposite. We have this fiction that if kids just feel good about themselves, if they are sovereign, if they are the centers right. of the universe, that then they will live and achieve to kind of confirm how great they are. But that doesn't work. No, what it's actually is, the opposite. Exactly. It, it, it hinders them. Yep, exactly. Because they want affirmation now. Like, like, so ipso facto, I'm awesome. I'm extraordinary. Whatever I create has to be vindicated through this kind of ubiquitous celebration of me. Mm -hmm. And, and right. so we've made kids the center of the universe at the same time that we've severed ever mean severed every meaningful connection that they can have. So what do we see? Loneliness. We see awful mental health. What is the word that I hear all the time? And any teacher who's listening is going to nod their head. Anxiety. Um, yeah. And that is because kids are lonely. They're by themselves. They don't date. They don't go out. They don't go to football games. They, they don't go to the movies. One out of five millennials say they don't have a good friend in the entire world. They don't love their country. They don't go to church. We've spent the last 18 months cocooning them, telling them there's virtue in being alone. Um, and so it shouldn't, I mean, I think that the kids growing up today are going to look back on you and me and be like, what did you do to me? Like, really? Oh, I mean, like, I've been telling people that history is going to judge us. And I think they're going, you know, I didn't do it personally and I've been against it. I've marched against it. But the reality is that I, reality is reality. And I do believe reality always wins. 
It yeah. catches up with you. You can't outrun it. You can't, I mean, you could put it off for a little while, but you can't outrun it and it can be vicious. And what I'm concerned about for this generation is, and for those of us who will be elderly <laughs> living yeah. in the country run by them, um, it is, is partly that, partly that they'll go all Robespierre on us and decide that we, you know, we did this to them and they won't be a hundred percent wrong. Um, and the other thing is they won't know how to fix anything that is literally broken, like, you know, nuclear power plants and airplanes right. and things like that, because they are just bereft of not just meaning, but also increasingly skill. So, and, and I'm sorry to say, I, I think I'd feel a little bit more confident in the, their ability to fill in the empty holes in their, in their soul if they could read. Yeah. Okay. So if yeah. they, if they were at least reading and they knew how to read and so forth, but you see, that's where as a parent, you know, I feel like I'm competing and you wrote about this in the book too, about your teenage daughter was, you know, was an avid reader and then hit high school and suddenly there's competition from the devices. And I had the same situation. My two eldest kids were absolutely voracious readers. I couldn't keep the books in the house. I mean, I was going to the used bookstore, trading them in and out, and it was just ridiculous. They'd read a book in an hour. You know, I couldn't keep keep up with it. And when they got their hands on their smartphones in high school, so ninth grade, and then I think it was like seventh grade respectively, because it, it happens with the younger kid gets a little sooner because the older kid got one. Right. Yeah. And also being in a split family, which, you know, you talk about it. I, I couldn't do anything about it. Believe me, but I tried, but you know, you need, they have to have the phone. It's for safety. Got to talk to dad, got to talk to mom, you know, whatever. There are all these practical reasons that we can't say no. And so even responsible parents who want to limit the tech and want to observe the tech and check the tech and put all kinds of restrictions, we keep bumping up against the culture which is that yep. all their friends have the tech and all the, the only other people they could associate with are, are on the other end of these monstrosities. And we're, what are we going to do? Be, be iconoclasts and say, nope, you're going to be lonely because I'm the weird parent who won't let you have it or go ahead and do it and then be a little bit micromanaging about the phones. I mean, it is a never ending struggle for responsible parents against a setup they didn't choose. Like yeah. I didn't choose this. This is the world in which I had children. And, and I, I, I agree. And I would tell you that uh, you remember a few weeks ago when uh, kind of the Virginia governor's race, I think surprised a lot of people yeah. because yeah. as a teacher, I've been waiting my whole life for voters to say that education was the number one issue. I've never seen right? that. Right. Yes. So I, 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 I know I've been like, please. Yes, finally. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I, so I wrote this this piece um, for Newsweek where I said, I think, yeah, yeah, people are frustrated about the the distance learning and the masks and the CRT and 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 the unions and all. I, I think that that's there. But I think there is a broader cultural um, frustration that you beautifully articulated, which is that as a dad, as a parent, why am I fighting my own culture to raise decent, normal human beings? I, I'm tired of fighting all these streams of my own society to get my, 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 my children uh, to have, you know, behaviors and values that I know will make them live better lives. And I, you know, it's interesting because hollowed out, yes, it was by and large a book about what I was noticing as a teacher, but if I'm being really honest on this show today, um, like it's also about my failings as a dad. Uh, and it, it bothers me to say that. And I, I don't like admitting it. Um, I'm right there with you. Because I'm yeah, right I know all the same things, you know, well, I'm reading I, this book and I'm going hundred percent Greeks, the classics. Yes, they should read. Why don't they know Aristotle, Plato? Why don't they, haven't they read this and that? And then I'm sitting there thinking, okay, Deb, what did you, how did you do that? Now? I mean, when they were homeschooled and I got them back out of school, but in school, uh, I wasn't banging on the door every single day because yeah. when I would go and tap lightly on the door and say, Hey, w when are you guys going to read? anything besides victim literature, right? I would get pushed back with such force that I felt like I was going to get in trouble. And I would tell people that I'm going to get in trouble with the school. And I have people say, what do you mean in trouble with the school? Well, how about this for size? I'm worried my kid's going to face backlash from their teacher because I'm making a stink. Yeah. I feel like my kid's going to feel like the outcast because they're being asked to read something that is different from what the other kids are being asked to read.
at home, for example, right. or I feel like the teachers are going to start undermining me even more because they see me as that, you know, creepy conservative lady that comes in and, you know, says nice things about the classics. Right. So that's what I mean by in trouble. We're like Faustian choices here. What do I do? Yeah. Well, and, and I, and I, I feel that kind of inner struggle because like you said, you don't want to be the kind of weird oddball parent. Like, you know, I, I'm against technology. You can't have the phone because kids are really good at saying, you know, my, my 11 year old son is like, well, that's how I talk to my friends at night. You know, that's that, you know, same thing with the video games. That's how I interact. Do you want me to be isolated? Do you want me to be lonely? You know, kind of an interesting point I wanted to make to your listeners is, you know, it's interesting when you go back and you read about the way that people in education thought about technology 10 or 12 years ago, you know, yeah. when iPads were coming out and, and all of these, you know, platforms and the, and the latest gizmos. And it was interesting because the thinking back then was the, the, the families that have the economic resources to buy these devices, to buy, uh, you know, these phones and, and, and these iPads and whatever, they're going to have a huge intellectual and, and academic advantage over kids who don't have all of these devices uh, because they're going to be able to access all of these methods of learning, right? The, the Je- kind of the Jeffersonian dream of the entire corpus of human knowledge in one place. Kids are going to, you know, those rich kids are going to be able to access that. And you know what's interesting is that now the movement among really involved parents is the privilege is taking the technology away, right? Right. And now, right, that, that, that we're going to take that away from you so that you have to read a book, so you have to engage, you have to go out front and play with your friends. Whereas the single parent who's working three jobs and, and just literally can't watch their kid that much time, they give them the device, they give them the phone, and it babysits them like crazy. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Are there times when I know my kid's been playing video games more than a half an hour, but I want to keep on reading a book? Or I want to like, you know, go out for a jog. Yeah. Yeah. I do it too. Um, and it's, it's just, it's so hard to resist. And the same thing, and I hope I'm, this isn't a weird conversation jump, but I no, kind of feel that I feel like the same thing is true of meals. Like, like the fact that we now spend more money in this country eating out than we do at the grocery store. Uh, right. The fact that this kind of individualism of young people, my kids never want to eat dinner with me ever. And they, they come up with every excuse in the world. I used, I, I put this in the book a little bit. Um, and I had some people push back and didn't believe this. It's like, well, go into a classroom. I want you to ask kids, what do you think is meant by the term the family dinner? And my students just look at me like I'm crazy, like I'm smoking right. something. I said, you know, at night when mom or dad make dinner and you sit down and you, 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 you eat together and you talk together and somebody cleans up and they look at me like I'm crazy. That radical individualism now goes into the mealtime and, and p- busy parents are either away working or they're running around for soccer games. They go through the drive through or parents right. who are working three jobs don't, you know, can't, aren't there. They're working at night. So that idea of talking to your kid about your day, engaging them, sitting down, it, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's simply not there. Uh, so, right. you know, one of the things that I, that I, I really want people who are listening to understand is that this is a generation that has had less adult time. Like they're literally mm-hmm. not connected to adult role models, adult values, adult expectations. We are creatures who learn by example, right? And we are either improved or depraved by the examples in front of us. Well, imagine a generation that has no examples of adults in their life. It used to be teachers, right? Now teachers vanished from their lives for 18 months. Um, And and what do they watch on, 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 on TikTok? What do they watch all the time? They watch other the craziest teenagers. adults looking they're, for attention. That's like, hey, let's marinate myself in narcissism and borderline personality disorder. Right, right. <laughs> and that'll and, and, work out well. So, so you're watching either crazy adults or other right. kids and their value system and their way of talking. And yeah, I mean, so well, I, I, it's this is something that Giorgio, who I, I believe uh, is a student, okay, um, because I've been just reading the comments and I I, I think he's a student. He says, for me, I don't like eating together because I don't like eating sounds. Now, this brings up something. While I was reading the book, I turned to my 13-year-old and I said, that's it. Because I've been saying it now for a long time. I mean, my husband's complaining we don't have enough family dinner. I said, that's it. That's it. We're, we're, it's family dinner now every night, no matter what. She said, but then I have to listen to you chew. And I said, okay, how about you sit at the end of the dining room table? Like you're the you know lady of the manor and we'll sit at the other end. She says, well, then you're just going to talk to each other and not to me. I said, no, 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 we'll, we'll talk to you, whatever. But I don't want to talk about politics. Okay. We won't talk about, po- well, there'll be a phone and politics free zone. Yes. We won't talk about current events. We won't talk about anything else. We'll have been dinner with family. 
but there's still the chewing. Yeah, I, my, I can hear it at the end of the table, yeah, she that, says. That's, that's my middle daughter, same thing. Yeah, my, my daughter, Emma, who's my middle child, says the exact same thing. And I really don't have an answer to that other than to kind yeah. of like try and chew quietly and then talk louder uh, other than that. But, 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 but I do think kids today in general, and I'm, I'm making a generalization, but I know my kids are not alone because there's Giorgio and there's your daughter. Yeah. I do think there is... Maybe it's because of the being immersed in only sounds I choose to hear because mm. I've got, you know, this or I'm got I'm doing the phone or listening to my music. They can be they not only create their own reality in terms of the visual experiences, they're creating a soundtrack for their lives so that includes some sounds and doesn't include other sounds that they don't want to listen to. And I think they are getting, generally speaking, a little more sensory processing disordered or dysregulated in other words what to us is not even audible like i don't hear other people i hear it if i tune in but i almost feel like they're like hypersensitive to certain stimuli that they did not used to be hypersensitive to that's two things one that's fascinating two i'm gonna rip you off just so you know creating a soundtrack for their lives i'm going <laughs> to steal that i hope that's okay go right ahead Th that's 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 a really uh eloquent way to say it, and, but I would I would expand even further. And so not only are they creating a soundtrack, uh, but they're yeah. also creating a, a kind of a, a visual. Uh, they, they, I mean, we all know that these social media platforms, and I, I want to kind of segue into talking about kind of the tension I have with my my daughter about this. Is you have these algorithms where they quickly figure out what you like to watch, right, and what you right. like to listen. And you and I know that intellectually, morally, and spiritually. We grow when we confront things that we don't like, or we don't agree with, or we have to consider exactly. where we're like, well, our reality is this big, but somebody out there is saying something that makes a lot of sense. It makes our reality a little bit bigger, but that's, that's hard. It's like lifting weights. It makes you stronger, but it's unpleasant. And so on these social media platforms, it's, it's, it's not a soundtrack. It's a kind of a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a visual track that's so repetitive and it, and it just, it just reinforces what they think over and over and over again. And here's the thing. Yes, intellectual and moral growth requires that we confront things that we have never thought about or that we disagree with, but it's unpleasant, right? It's, it's unpleasant. I mean, I tell people, right. if you're a Christian, go read Nietzsche. If you're an atheist, ah. go, read, go read, you know, <laughs> if, if you're an atheist, yeah. go, read, go read C.S. Lewis. If you're a hardcore liberal, go watch Fox News. Go read the National Review. Uh, if you are a conservative, you know, watch MSNBC, listen right. to what uh, liberals on the other side say. You have to do that. But social media doesn't do that because it's pleasant to be told right. that you're right all the time. And my daughter, um, who will never watch this so I can talk about her a little bit, <laughs> uh, she, um, who is coming home from college uh, tomorrow and who is the light of my life, we really began, you talk about how no politics, you know, she would watch these videos, these TikTok videos, these Instagram videos. And it would just say the same thing over and over and over again about how awful America is, how oppressed everybody is. The you know, Howard she, Zinn line, blah, uh, blah, blah, uh, blah. Absolutely. The, 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 this, this, this idea that uh, America was founded on a myth and a lie. And she started saying, like, Dad, what's so great about capitalism? You know, she started repeating all these tropes about, well, Communism is great. We just haven't done it the right way, but my generation is going to do it the right way. Okay, well, mm. I, I think a lot of people have said that and they ended up in, in camps. So, you know, I don't really, uh, but, but where was she getting that from? And so right. if I was not a parent out there, I would say, Jeremy, take the damn phone away. Take it away. It's not right. that hard. But it, it actually is that hard. <laughs> it is actually that hard. It really is. And like your brilliant point earlier, we parents are just sick and tired of fighting the broader society, the broader culture. We're tired of fighting Hollywood and our schools uh, and, and social media. I mean, if you think about it, conservatism yeah. doesn't have much, right? We don't have New York, right? We don't have the media. We don't have the schools of education. We don't have entertainment, right? We don't have social media. We don't have the Silicon Valley. We don't yeah. have much. And yet we're fighting all of these things. And it's really frustrating. And I think I'm coming across as angry. I'm not. No, it's but just, but it's exhausting. And then when you hear this message that like, well, the kids are, the kids are self-centered. The kids misbehave. The kids are not learning. The kids are not reading. The kids are not all right. And you know, it all starts in the home. So it's the parent's fault. And then I try to make the point to people like, yes, but every parent was once a student. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for the better part of 30 years, at least as far as the kind of like placating the children and making them the center of the known universe. It wasn't like people were discouraged from 
uh, forming really close appropriate uh, attachments to their babies. You know, in other words, like ferberize your kid, let them cry it out. You know, <laughs> like yeah. don't pick them up when they cry. But once they're three, hand them a trophy because they didn't fall down. You know, I mean, we've been getting conflicting messages. And in order to sell all the things attached to parent parenting, you know, parenting magazines and advertisements, and then we have 24 hour news now, 24 hour advertisement. They've had to have the, the new and the different and the constantly changing. And all if all you wanted to do was raise your kids the way your dad did, you said, I just yeah. want to emulate my dad. He was a great dad. I just want to do the same things. You had a constant barrage of voices. Don't do that. That's bad. And so you're like, but that's what I know. That's yeah. what I know. That's what worked for me. And it made me a happy, well-adjusted person. I just want to turn around and do the same. Or even I had a crap childhood, but at least I was dialed in and said, you know what? I don't want to do that. And yeah. so I read up on what makes a good parent. Okay. This consistency, the family dinners, all these kind of things. But then society is going, no, you have to work because women's lib and you have to go get a job and, oh, but you also have to do this and you have to do that. So when people say, well, don't, don't whine and cry mom or, or dad, you should just do this, that, and the other. It's like, everybody's shooting us to death. They're like shooting all over us. And we don't, there is no institution out there that is saying, look, the family is the most important thing in our society. And we need to respect and champion parental rights, parent family integrity. And you know what we need to, our schools need to support strong families. Our policies need to support strong families. You know, we, that it, we believe in the center of that. And instead of shooting all over parents, you're doing it wrong. We're going to yeah. say, look, we're here to support you doing it. Period. You're doing it. Yay. Yeah. You're yeah. there, you're home, you're taking care of the kids, you're slugging it out with your job, whatever you're doing. And instead, they're here the 57,000 ways you're doing it wrong. And then every effort we make to try to just hold it together is coming up against that. And yeah. it's it's just exhausting. That, and our great. kids are hearing it too. Kids don't live in a vacuum. So when they go on social media and they say like, your mom sucks if she doesn't do this. Your dad is a horrible person if he does that and says that. Well, I, I think, and I think what you've put your finger on is the fact that as a society, we now seem to be hesitant to say the things that we know are true. Uh, and, and whenever truth uh, gets hidden behind uh, a citadel of, of ideology, then you know that your society is really in trouble. Uh, yeah. What do we know? We know, we know for a fact that the number one predictor of academic outcomes yeah. is family, right? And, 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 you know, we all know, I mean, the OECD uh, did a, a, a study that said, you know, at best, the impact that a teacher has uh, on a, a student's academic performance is maybe 10%. Um, there's a, what we call the 91 to 9 problem in education, which is if you look at a five-year-old and an 18-year-old and the amount of time that they spend at home versus the time they spend at school, they only mm -hmm. spend 9% of their time from the time of being five to 18 at school, they spend 91% somewhere else. And, and I think that for some reason, we believe uh, that what that constitutes that 91% is not going to be decisive and formative. And it is, it, it's absolutely. So we, like I said before, inputs matter. And if there's anything I could, you know, if, if, if hollowed out has really a distilled basic idea, it is that the inputs into our children's lives matter. And the things that are going into their minds and their souls uh, are, are tainted. They are not good. They are not productive. And the output is unhappiness. It's misery. Right. It's isolation. It's loneliness. It's anti-Americanism. It's a kind of bigotry towards, towards or a, not even big, I wouldn't say bigotry, but maybe ignorance about religion because those right. inputs are real. And if we right. don't want to address those inputs, don't be shocked when the outputs are uh, what they are. And, and, and not to, like I said, I don't want to get kind of overly romanticized my profession, but I will tell you, we talked about this a little bit before we went live, Deb which is the way that my dad, who was a teacher, looked at education, the way that I look at being a teacher, it is really different uh, than the way maybe, a, and I, I don't want, this is a broad brush, so I'm sure there are a lot of great 25 and 35 year old teachers out there. But by and large, I would say that a lot of young teachers look at themselves very differently. They see themselves as a kind of quasi therapist, uh, yes. kind of a quasi counselor, quasi friend, quasi parent. Because now we look at schools not as academic institutions, we see them as an enclave for social services. We say, yes. look at all the things that kids are not getting at home 
And now the schools must provide that. And so that's why you have this advent of 25 year olds who see themselves as uh, you know, stand in friends. They see themselves as, as well, I'm here to help you be an activist. Um, I, you know, th- that is my role. Whereas I would say, no, yeah. your role is to help them read and write and know the basic things upon which a, a, a good life can be based. Um, and, and that's and, and that's an indictment, not of young teachers. That's an indictment of civil society writ large, that we don't provide those things to the young people in that 91% of their lives. Well, you talk in the book about um, sense of purpose and how, you know, like the postmodern purpose of education is liberation, mm-hmm. you know, that you can't, that, that they would be liberated from the self. You have to be liberated from, you know, and, and they, so they go actively disintegrate the self. And then of course, when you do that, there's such a sense of loss and yes. um, being standing in quicksand. I think you d- described it, right? That you're going to grasp around for anything, you know, and, and you're going to, gr- going to become more tribal and more collectivist yes. than even. So that's sort of the, the, the paradox, this radical individualism leads to a kind of tribalism because human beings are social creatures. We are really yes. not designed to be unmoored from other people. And if you, if you do that and you fragment it and say, no, you're not you, you're a, this, this hyphen, 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 blah, blah, blah from outside. Not only are you feeling vulnerable to any criticism of any of those groups, cause that's now who you are, but also you have this almost like infant, like attachment to that group yes. because you have no ability to stand on your own. There's no strength. There's no real confidence. And they call that liberation. I call that enslavement. Yeah, well, I think I, they, I, they've got it ba- exactly backwards. Well, the, well, first of all, we can be enslaved by our own desires, right? Yeah. Somebody who's addicted to drugs does not feel free, right? No. Somebody who has a, who's an alcoholic does not feel free uh, because their desires uh, have taken over, right? And that's kind of, you know, the way that you and I look at freedom might be like, well, you're free when you have mastered yourself and you can be the man or woman you want to be. Uh, yeah. That That's different than I can do whatever I want to do, which is kind of an infantile Exactly. Of, of freedom. The toddlers right? want It's that. a toddler's view. Like, I want what I want. And if you stop me, then you're oppressing me. That, that's a child's view of freedom. And But I, what I would say is to echo you is I think human beings are suckers for meaning. Like we, we have to find meaning somewhere. And if we, if we denigrate family and we denigrate country and we denigrate kin and we denigrate faith and we denigrate friendship and we, and we, and we denigrate education, people are going to find meaning somewhere. And like you said, we will find it in politics through a kind of tribalized view of, 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 of political discourse. And, and so everything becomes, everything becomes distorted and corrupt. So instead of saying, I want to date somebody, I want to fall in love with somebody, I want to marry somebody, what fills that void is something like pornography. It's something like meaningless sexuality. Uh, people say, well, I'm, 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 I'm lonely. Uh, and, and, and what you and I would say is we'll make friendship. Well, now instead we use social media and nobody's a real friend on social media. Uh, mm-hmm. And so tribalism replaces patriotism, uh, uh, eroticism uh, uh, replaces love, uh, online life replaces friendship. And, and you, you see the fact that that doesn't work. How do we know? Right. Ask people, ask young people, are you happy? Let me give you a statistic that I came across recently that it's the kind of thing that, you know, sometimes you read a statistic and you're like, that can't be right. I had to right. have misread it. So to all the people out there uh, who would say that this is just a grumpy old man and I'm not old, a uh, curmudgeon, a crank, uh, you know. If you're old, I'm ancient. <laughs> <laughs> but, but consider this. The CDC released a report last year that said this. One out of four 18 to 24 year olds. Okay, these are young people that, that the prime of life, young, verve, vivacity, zeal. One out of four 18 to 24 year olds in this country have considered suicide. Yep. Let me say that again. One out of four have thought about suicide, have seriously thought about it. There is something wrong in our country when the part of life when you're supposed to be the most voracious in your desire for life and living and and your health and your dreams and you want to fall in love and you want to travel the world and read the big book. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. Charles, he's fading away because it's getting darker. darker. Do you know know what's happened? You know what's happened? Is the sun's it, gone down? It never rains in Bakersfield and there's a storm coming. Should I take like five seconds and turn on my lights? I'm going to turn on yeah, my lights. Yeah, turn yeah. Turn on your lights. I don't, I, I don't want Charles to, you know, not be able to see you. <laughs> That's better. 
better? Yes. Am I here? Okay. okay. Yes. It, it never rains in Bakersfield. I did not expect this at all. I've done so many <laughs> interviews. So yes, I'm here. I'm vibrant. Thank you, Charles. Okay. But uh, I hope that made sense. No, it absolutely made sense. And it, you know, it's, I find myself increasingly laughing at inappropriate times when I'm presenting data to people last night in the Twitter space, same thing. I was explaining some of the phenomena we're seeing and I found myself in this almost like neurotic laughter presenting it because you can't believe it. Like you, yeah. you're, you're saying things, you're like, how can this be true? And it comes out, you know, inappropriate because it would be too depressing for me to say one in four children has considered to, you know, it, so you say these things like what? Um, but, and for us, well, at least for me, it's hard to listen to them because you know, for them, it's real. It's yeah. real. Like th th that is how they genuinely feel. They're not being hyperbolic. They don't have anything inside to fill that up. But for those of us who grew up with a completely different worldview and mindset, we're looking at them like, I don't even know what to say because I literally inhabit a different reality than you. I mean, that's what's going through my mind. I'm not saying it. And I I can't even offer anything that doesn't sound pedantic, Yeah. right? I don't know how to like be here for you and, 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 and help you through this time because inside I'm silently screaming, you live in one of the wealthiest, freest, like most privileged. <laughs> yep. I mean, like it's, it, and even thinking back to my childhood, which was horrible. And there's part of me that wants to go like, uh, but, I, see, but that's, you know, that's, I don't know but, what but, to but say. That, but that says to me, we don't have, this is not a, a material crisis. It's a moral and spiritual crisis right. that we're talking about. I don't and even that, know how to talk about it. With, yeah, that, with my and, own kids. And sometimes they don't have a grammar of communication for it. I mean, think about it this way. Think about everything that makes our, and I don't want to get overly emotional and, and, and like you said, hyperbolic, but I want you to think about everything in your life that makes, gives you moments of joy. I don't mean happiness. I mean joy. The kind of sense that like you are one with existence itself. This idea that we, we have this brief amount of time in the universe right. and what are we going to do with it? And there are moments that sprinkle complete joy and happiness and fulfillment onto us. And when I think of all the things that do that in my life, I realize that those things are missing in the lives of young people. Yeah. Um, there are not enough sunsets, poems, or symphonies in the universe for me to describe the enormity of my love for my children. Like, I, I, exactly. Like, there's, there's, there's no form of communication. I don't care if you're talking about ancient Aramaic and Greek or the most beautiful language in the world or the most powerful poet or the most revelatory prophet. They can't capture how I feel this love, this transcendent love that makes me, by the way, believe in a loving God. That's how much I love my kids is they confirm to me that God is a God, like my view is a God of love. How do you explain that to somebody that doesn't believe in family? I mean, and so what, what happens is, is that there is this kind of unbridgeable gap, I feel, erupting between people who understand, like, how do you explain to somebody who won't read a book what it feels like to be utterly transformed by an author? I mean, when I was a senior in college, I read a book called The Death of Ivan Illich by Leo Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. And it's not hyperbole for me to say that at the beginning of reading that novella, because you could read it in 90 minutes. I hope anybody out there will pick up The Death of Ivan Illich. At the beginning of that novella, I was one kind of man with one set of aspirations. And when I put it down, I was a different kind of man. I, I, and, and, and we read big books. We read big ideas. Because that was Les Mis for me. Longer book, though. <laughs> oh, very, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's yeah, a big, but I that's a, you can't not be transformed by but, Victor Hugo. But how do you but how do you describe that for somebody who doesn't want to read, who doesn't know. understand the magic of it? It to me, it's kind of like faith. Is that you know, there's that part in the Sermon on the Mount where Christ says, "Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see the face of God." Which means you have to believe something before you see it. Seeing is believing is not true. You have to believe that something is there before you even open yourself to seeing it. And so to me, I, I'm trying to get my students to see the power of learning, the power of love, the power of friendships, the power of books. The tra I mean, again, all of these things that just make our lives bigger. But it's they just don't not have there. any, especially once they hit puberty. You know, we know from just developmental research that it's a natural progression for the developing human to start to pull away from their parents 
and start to look to the outside world for influence and and meaning and so forth more. Like, I mean, at least half and increasingly as they get older, more, like about 60, 40. And there, I just think we are bereft of real heroes. Um, we don't celebrate the right things. I, and I mean that in the literal sense, we don't celebrate the right things in our, in our culture. What we celebrate is so often really pretty base and, you know, fame for fame's sake. Um, you know, the, we might celebrate, you know, uh, athletic achievement, but we never really see the process of how, all the hard work that it took to get there. Yeah. And, um, you know, we celebrate the biggest, the most, the fastest, the things like that. But how about the effort? How about the effort? You remember and those... it, it's just, they're not seeing, they're not, they're not able to believe that they could do things because the people they see doing things are, have reached they're in the 0.001%, right? The famous. Right. But there's a giant gray area of achievement in between there that they could reach. They don't see that though. They're like, here I am on my couch and there's that person with a hundred million likes or whatever. And, and that's because they, that's because the kinds of people who we used to celebrate, we don't celebrate anymore. Mm -hmm. So, th so there's that great line at the end of George Eliot's book. I think it's called middle March. And I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the, the quote, but it's essentially the fact that our lives are possible because of the lives of people with graves that are never visited, right? The nobility of a life that contributes, but does so quietly, meekly, nobly, uh, right. humbly. And there, there, and there's value in that life. There's yeah. value in, 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 in when my lights go out, somebody climbs in the middle of a storm, climbs that electric tower to turn it back on. But I never see who that is. There are policemen patrolling out there when I sleep at night who keep me safe. There are people who go across the world to prevent terrorism, to protect my children's life. And I think what happens is when the kind of that membrane, that kind of connective tissue that mm -hmm. connects young people to that kind of a life is missing we, because we don't, yep. we don't see that. We don't celebrate that. We don't see the value in it. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I've begun to appreciate more in my forties is just the simple eloquence and wonderment of making a difference in your own little corner of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 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 stop worrying about the history books. Go look at the schools who are named after somebody who lived in your country, in your city, fifty years ago. Look at that little that little plaque that's in a school. That what what did that person do, right? Those are the that's the kind of life I think we should be celebrating for our young people. You know, the kind mm -hmm. of local statues, the local plaques. Don't worry about a million followers. Don't worry about fame. Don't worry about being, you know, a YouTube celebrity. Worry about being somebody who who taught one other human being how to read, right? Yeah. That kind of nobility, that kind of life, that kind of localism. That's a that's a conservative value. But the problem right. is their social media is a global lens. So that's one of the reasons why they're so negative. Is that mm -hmm. you know there's that famous expression that says about journalists. It's not our it's not our job to report on the planes that land. Well, you're, like you said a minute ago, there's so much that's right about their life, so much that's right. good, but they don't right. see that. We don't report on that, right? Well, and we also um, we've had a, a recent. I mean, I don't know how long we would go. It's I mean, it's Lee Howard's in. Okay, we've demonized the heroes that used to inspire us or used to at least inform us about our purpose as Americans, if nothing else. You talk a lot in the book about Thomas Jefferson. And one of the things you pointed out that I really want the audience to hear, although I hope they all go read the book, is the the irony is that and now teachers are doing it, too. But, you know, young people are demonizing the founders. Let's just take the founders and Jefferson in particular, because, you know, they, they did a bad thing or look, I can point to this factoid that I know about this person and I learned it on TikTok or I learned it from Howard Zinn or something. And because their mindset is, oh, he cheated on his wife, you know, on TikTok or some celebrity cheated on a wife. And that's always oh, a big scandal. So they don't ever look past that to the enormity of what he stood for. And here's a really important point. They talk about the failures of America and how the Declaration of Independence, if they can get it separated from the Constitution, which is its own hurdle for most of them. <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, they 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 talk about, oh, it was a big lie from the beginning. They were hypocrites and all that. But they forget, as you point out, that the 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 liberation they they claim to be seeking, the freedom and equality they claim to be seeking is an idea that he took 
and transcribed. He wrote it down and they don't understand the enormity of that one action that, that in terms of human history, that was so revolutionary before a single shot was fired. The fact that he wrote that, that document all by itself was in, in all of human history, like, ta-da, you know, like we should all be standing back going, oh my God, right? But we don't do that. We don't celebrate that. And yet they'll be like, I want this liberty. It's a liberty you only even know about as a concept because of the man whose face you want to chisel off Mount Rushmore. Rushmore. Yeah, and yeah. they don't understand that. They don't. And that I do, I do fault schools for. I'm sorry, I do. Yeah. No, no, I know. I, I understand why you would. Um, but a, a lot to say there. Uh, you're right. I'll, I'll, I think you can probably tell in the book that my training is in political science by the end, yeah. uh, right? That that's and what worries me so much. Uh, and you just beautifully articulated it. So if I'm just repeating what you're saying, you can <laughs> shut me, you can shut me down. But but the United States is unique, right? If you look in the it's back totally. of the one, if you look in the back of the one dollar bill, there's a, a Latin expression that says "Novius Ordo Seclarum," right? A new order of the ages. That there's a reason why we call this the American experiment, is because it is an experiment. And our way of life is is rare. It's it's the exception to the rule. Freedom is not the, the 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 rule of history. Oppression and despotism is. Prosperity is not the rule of history. Failure and poverty is. Progress is not the way. Is not the rule. It is it is it is you know st status and or being static and, and and degeneration. And so we exist in this really special little moment of history where we have these kinds of freedoms and prosperity and progress that is like the point 1% of human history. And yet when you're born into this time, you take it as being normal. You don't realize how precious it is. It was a so, 5,000 year leap, literally. Exactly. Beautiful. Like, well said, because, because it didn't have to happen, by the way. You know, there are some things that if a scientist didn't discover it, somebody else would have done it. It is not the case that if the American Revolution didn't happen, somebody else would have become the first liberal democracy. That's not the case. That is absolutely not the case. Uh, I mean, you could go all the way back to the Greeks. What happens? And it's if not permanent by default. No, no. We, How we many ha people have told us that from Ben Franklin to Abraham Lincoln and, and on forward? And, and that's the point I want. That's what I'm trying to get to is our way of life has to be renewed in every single generation. The most I, I would encourage anybody who's listening to this. You know, we always talk about Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address. Great. We always talk about his second inaugural speech. Great. But go back to 1838 when he was a young man. Uh, and I think it's his mo the most underappreciated speech in American history. And it's called his Lyceum Address. And what Lincoln talks about there, and remember, 1838 is not that far out from 1776 or 1787. And Lincoln understands that now we're having like a generation. These young people, they are 60 or 70 years removed from the American Revolution. And he says, the fathers have got to explain to their sons what was sacrificed, what we did to give you this, that the fecundity of freedom, the, the, the gospel of prosperity, the beauty of Madisonian constitutionalism is the exception to the rule. And if you want to renew it, here are the values that you have to have. Now, what worries me is this, is that America is not a matter of the skin, right? It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the soul. And it's a matter of believing in a certain view of, of, of justice, because at the end of the day, what unites us, we don't have a king. We don't have an official church. We don't have a skin color. We don't have a language, right? We don't have any of that stuff. We have a story, right? We have a story. We have a project. And an if you do, an idea, right? I mean, that's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt said that, you know, America is based, we are a, a, a country yoked together through a set of beliefs, what Lincoln called a proposition. Well, if you don't know what the proposition is, or even worse, as you said, if you don't even give a crap what the proposition is, you think it's a lie, you think it's oppression, you think that it's it's malevolence, then my question is, where's the unum in the e pluribus unum, right? What unites us? What makes us one people? If it's not our story, and, and th then, then what makes you and me an America, what unites us, what yokes right. us together. And that's when you talk about the evils of tribalism. Tribalism is really dangerous when you lose the animating creed of a country that used to unite us, which, again, if you want to have a real cynical view on what's happening in the schools, why teach a love of country if you want to completely revolutionize what that country is? Right. Cor cor so, correct. Right. right? Yeah. 
And that that's why I really I've been saying and tell me if you agree that we parents it's, you know, by all means, start taking more responsibility for your children's education, whatever that looks like for you. OK, I mean, I have my preferences and my opinions, but whatever it's going to look like for you, get dig in. OK, but also and, and if that means supplementing, then it means supplementing to the best of your ability. But stop apologizing and stop being cowardly. What do I mean by cowardly? Well, I may be a coward in terms of taking the phone completely away from my children. Okay. Yeah. But I have, you know, limited it and I've done as much as I can do and still have some peace in my home, but I am not apologizing to any other adult in America about my defense of this country, of our founding principles, of enlightenment values or any of that. And what I'm seeing too many adults are like, writing DMs to me. Like, I really agree with you, but I can't say it publicly. Uh, what? Or I, you know, when I was going and fighting with my kids' schools and I would talk privately to other parents that, oh, I completely agree with you. I can't stand that. They're not making them read literature, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, will you go with me? Will you just, oh, I couldn't possibly because then I'll get, you know, I did, 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 did. stop it. That kind of cowardice, you're going to lose everything. You're going to, not just your child, because that's going to happen. You're going to lose your child if you if you won't have the moral courage to stand up for the values you believe in publicly. How do you expect your child privately to adopt them? They're not going, they're looking at you and they're looking at your behavior. And just because they say, oh, you're embarrassing me, mom, whatever. Someday in the future, they're going to remember that you didn't care enough about your values to stick up for them when it counted. Yeah. And that's, that's my message is stop apologizing. And for teachers, I would say the same thing. I'm sure you never did. I'm sure you didn't stand in a classroom and say, well, yeah, America did really, really bad stuff. And you know, yeah, we're pretty bad, but I'm sure you said, Hey, you're looking at it through a present day lens. You, you know, you can't, that that's not appropriate. You know, it's yeah. fine to say we should improve. It's fine to say that we, but we have, and we're on a continuous journey towards improvement. But no, you don't get to sit here in 2021 and judge Thomas Jefferson in, by 2021 values. That's not fair. And you wouldn't want someone almost 300 years hence to look back at you and say, oh, how did you not know better? Yeah, exactly. And what, what I would say is, and I think I said this in the book, of all the intellectual habits that young people have that just annoys me, bothers me, frustrates me the most is, and I don't know why they have this trouble, is this notion that they are not omnisciently above history. They yeah. are not omniscient. They are not, you know, they are not the first, you know, Platonists in history looking down, seeing the truth of things. No, we are all in the stream of history itself. Um, right. and, and, and when you believe that you're the first generation to be truly enlightened, Oh, I get it. You know, in that kind of patronizing term you hear from young people, do the work, do the work. It's like, kids, you are the most ignorant generation in American history. Like your knowledge of the of the country is so minimal and you're telling me to do the work and, and, and the kind of, and again, I'm not, I'm not railing against young people because I, 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 I truly believe that they can still be a great generation. But do you think that you're the first generation to realize that there were glaring contradictions between our founding documents and the right. treatment of people in this country. Yeah, I think no. we fought a war over it. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I don't know. I, I, I seem to recall something. And if, like that, and yeah. if you look at, yeah, and if you look at, you know, what do older Americans know about our history and our, and our constitution versus what young people know? I mean, Deb, one out of 10 Americans think that Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court. I'm not making that up. Oh right? my God, no. My favorite statistic, right? And so don't tell me to do the work, but because the problem is this, and I think you really highlighted it well. Young people, and, and of course, their surrogates in, in the media say, look at these awful episodes in American history. And there are plenty of them. And I, I, I would never deny them. I think and we should we should know. We should know uh, about Juneteenth. We should know about the Tulsa massacre. Know about the things. The more, the better. That's fine. But the problem is when you say that awful moment in American history or that fact about that founding father, that defines them. Like that is who this country is. Whereas I would say, I think you would say, no, this country is, we did those things, but as a country, as a generation, we said we're going to right the wrong. So the story of slavery is, America is not the story of slavery, it's the 13th Amendment and 14th Amendment, right? right? The, the, the right. story of segregation is not segregation, it's the civil rights movement. And, well, Martin and we've been letter perpetually self-conscious. 
Yes. Show me the other nation on planet Earth that has been as self-conscious about our flaws as the United States of America. No, sorry. I've lived overseas. I've not seen it. I've not. I mean, even in, in Germany and Austria, I lived in Austria. I did not see as much self-consciousness about what happened as I have seen about slavery in the United States. That's a fact. And, you know, they, they banned certain things and they did certain things, but I've not seen on the personal individual level, the same degree of, you know, whatever it is. Well, and, you there's, put, and there's a sorry, difference between, I'm sorry, there's a difference between self-criticism, which is good, but self-loathing is not right? no, because, no, because I, I no. would, I would put it this way is I wouldn't ask them to hate themselves. I'm just saying, well, you know, it, it, well, no, I, no, but I, I was surprised. The, right. Well, I think the problem is that like, I was always taught about a, a really flawed country that absolutely continues to try to redeem itself. Right. That's different than learning about a country and say it's irredeemable, right? So like exactly. the, six, the 1619 Project said, you know, racism is in our DNA. Well, you can't change your DNA. Whereas, That's right. whereas I would say with a country of freedom and agency, we can change. That's the whole point of the country exactly. is re constant redemption. But if you think it's irredeemable, then there's not much you can do about that other than start over, which right. I don't want to do. Yeah. And they're not inquisitive. This is not a generation that hears a really negative thing about their country and says, I'm going to go find out if that's even true. Right. And in fact, it, and it's pretty typical, actually, that if you as a human hear something very negative about something that you're associated with or a person or in your country, or whatever, the, your first instinct is, I don't want to be associated with that. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to be associated with the negative thing. And so you're, you're, it's not to go, I'm going to verify that that thing is really that bad, especially if you haven't been taught that skill of, of thinking critically from the get go. You're not a, a proficient reader. You haven't been uh, presented with any, any kind of counterbalance to the negative information at all. It's all struggle. It's all negative. And, you know, then they tell you, this is the truth. This is the truth. And I, I know it's difficult when you want to stick up for your values and, and your beliefs and, and your country, because there's always somebody right now going, oh, so you're one of those right wing Nazi fascist extreme. They call you all the evil names. It's a tactic, though. It's a tactic that people who have no other argument, they have no real argument. So they just use words to put you off the scent. Just, you know, we're going to demonize you. Right. And I'm seeing a lot of linguistic trickery going on and our kids are ill prepared to deal with it. Again, because the teaching has not given them that. And so when they use this like neuro linguistic programming on them, they're sitting ducks. Yeah. Well, they're and, sitting and, ducks. Yeah. And what I would say about that is, you know, when you look at uh, when you look at the way that we think about these, you know, these different episodes in American history that we're we're not necessarily proud of, um, you know, what what bothers me is that young people look at that and, and they rightly say, well, I don't want anything to do with that past. And, and, exactly. and I get that, right? And, and I, I agree with them. I, I, I don't want anything to do with that past either, which means I have to absorb what this country was supposed to be about, realize where we came up short. And my generation, the, right. the, 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 the commission that I have is to live up to that ideal. Remember, the, right. the, the preamble doesn't say a perfect union. It says a more perfect union. But their reaction to it is that Anybody who did anything in the past that is at variance with a 2021 worldview, we literally have to take down those statues. We literally have to say, I want nothing to do with them, right. which is, I would say, there, there's a reason why we celebrate people. Like, so for instance, I went to a college in Virginia called Washington and Lee University, mm -hmm. right? As we all know, Robert E. Lee uh, was the head of the Confederate Army. But the reason why Ro Robert E. Lee was put into the name of the college has nothing to do with the Civil War. It has to do with the fact yeah. that after the war, he became president of the college. He instituted a lot of great things, and that's why he's in the namesake. That's not a hard concept. We don't honor Thomas Jefferson because of the bad stuff. It's very clear we honor Jefferson because, you know, he was, you know, the, 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 the writer of the Declaration of Independence and the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom and the founder of UVA and, and all his achievements as president. He did these other things because he was a human being, but we celebrate the things that transformed the country. And I, I remember being shocked uh, a few years ago where I was talking about how I think um, Grant as a president and as a, an American is underappreciated. And, and I write about this in the book a little bit. And I had a student say, oh, you mean the alcoholic, right? Like and, and the, ent the entirety of the guy's life. That's like all they know. All they know is the negative. 
And so it's so really can we hard. do that with Angela Davis and Nat Turner and a few other people and Che Guevara? I mean, can we can we apply the same at least yeah. if we're going to do that? Can we also do it with, you know, Karl Marx and Joseph Stalin and, and you know, I mean, Mao? It, it, exactly. I mean, if, if we want to if we want to talk about canceling people, let, let's look at who your heroes are. Uh, and Seriously. I guarantee, you know, and, and so at the end of the day, we celebrate what is laudatory. Uh, we, 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 we do not deny the bad. We study it and we say, this is what we moved on. This is what we corrected. Right. This is what we remedied. But this notion that it has to be a wholesale rejection of everything that came before is so sad to me. I mean, not to get too academic, but, you know, my, my favorite uh, historian from antiquity was Plutarch because Plutarch wrote a book called Plutarch's Lives, where he talks about all these extraordinary Greeks and Romans and these achievements of them. And the founding fathers loved Plutarch. And they read about Cato and Cicero and Caesar and uh, you know Pericles and all these extraordinary men from the past. And Madison and Jefferson, Washington and Jay, all of these men understood that they were not perfect in their time, but we're gonna take what was right about them and use that to inspire us to do extraordinary things today. And what makes me sad, Deb, is that America, we have our own extraordinary history full of amazing men and women who young people could learn from to say, I'm going to live a better life because of what Madison did or Lincoln did or, or, or Martin Luther King did. But because it's cool, it's chic, it's, it's, it, it, it kind of elevates our status to have a disdain for everything that came before, we're not absorbing what would help our own lives. And that makes me sad. Yeah, it's very sad. I really, I will, I really want to see. I like to participate in a movement that makes classical education cool. Yeah, you know, makes well, I, it the cool thing. And yeah, well, and I, I just, I think it can be. I think it can happen. But I think it's going to take, as you point out in the book, it's going to take like all of us. It's going to take. It's going to take a concerted effort on the part of concerned adults to do more than just say. Well, let's add more of this or let's, you know, like balance with that. I'm seeing a lot of that lately. Like, well, don't don't rail against the um, don't rail against, you know, the woke stuff in the schools. Just balance it out. Add some more books about this and that. And like, I, I don't think you're you're getting the point. If you can't balance. First of all, the juxtaposition of opposites is not the same as balance. OK, yeah. and if you if a society is not willing to put a stake in the ground and say, we're the United States of America and we like to stay the United States of America and the United States of America was founded on these core principles and we like these core principles and we want to maintain these core principles because the principles are neither bad nor good. They're principles. We decided they were good however many years ago and they brought us to this point. It's not the principles that messed up. It was the people either living up to them or not living up to them. We are still committed to these principles. We want to live up to them. Here are some incremental changes we need to make in this area, this area, and this area. We're going to work together as a people, e pluribus unum, to do it. And we're not going to apologize for people we weren't and things yeah. that we didn't live through and so forth. That's in the past and we're not going there. Exactly. We're going and, there. And by the way, it's so intellectually lazy and easy to, to attack those who can't respond exactly uh, you know to, to just rail against the past uh now understand it engage it ask what can we learn from it what did we do wrong so that we can do right in the future but exactly. but you, you're absolutely right about that uh and you know I, I would also say uh in 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 response to that that you know one of the things that i, I notice a lot of young people do uh is is you mentioned this earlier is that you talk about who do you admire it's it's always somebody from today Right. Have you ever noticed like, like they, they can never mention somebody from the past because to them, ipso facto, the past was bad because it was at variance with what we believe in 2021. And, and you know, one of the things I, I just I hate is this idea that we need to constantly recreate, you know, and I guess that makes me kind of conservative because I think, you know, we have we know how to live a good life. We know how to renew American civilization. We don't need to reinvent the wheel uh, every time. I mean, this is kind of the, you know, the thing that I, I, I this is my newest kind of annoyance is this idea that the newest idea in education has got to be the best idea in education. <laughs> and I would say, you know what, don't, don't read the last, latest article on edutopia to figure out how to educate the next generation of young people. Go look at that notebook from 1906. Yeah, exactly. That you, had, that you wrote about, I mean, I, my grandfather was born in 1896. He's deceased obviously. Um, <laughs> and fought in both world wars. And he showed me some of his, work, you know, for when he was a kid. And he actually talked to me about the test he had to pass to get into Amherst college. And 
you know, he had to know Latin, he had to know Greek, he had Greek, to know, yeah. you know, certain kinds of math I hadn't even studied. And I mean, just this is a guy whose parents spoke not a word of English. They both came from Russia. He was an only child growing up in Brooklyn and had to take, you know, a train and a horse and buggy to college. And he had to work his whole way through while he was there as a dishwasher, like as a little busboy dishwasher in the dining hall, because otherwise he couldn't have afforded the meager tuition was like $700 a year or yeah. something like that. But he still couldn't afford it. And this was a big deal, you know, and he would studied and studied and studied and studied and studied with parents who couldn't even speak the language. Okay, but he didn't speak Russian because they insisted on speaking English to him in their broken way. And then he tried to teach them English. And our kids can't conceive of this world. And like you said, they're they're, they're my hero is my grandfather. Yeah. He's he's gone now, but he's my hero and he was my hero growing up. And the thing he always said to me was he said, Life is not a dream in the clover. Onto the walls, onto the walls, onto the walls and over. And that was every time I'd be like, oh, this is hard, blah, 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 he just repeated that phrase. And I'm telling you, every time I got into something hard or, you know, like, oh, I'm in school and oh my God, I got this exam or a paper or breakup or something terrible happened. I just kept repeating that in my head. Kids need these things too. Now, wherever you get it from, if it's a saying from your grandfather, if it's from a prayer, if it's from church, it's from if whatever it is, you need these little messages to hold on to that say, you know, yes. Life is hard. Yeah. It's hard for everyone. You're not unique. The degree to which it's difficult, the ways in which it's difficult might be different for you and somebody else. And you know, you don't have a right to belittle somebody else's hard and they don't have a right to belittle yours. Okay. It's hard period, but yours is yours and theirs is theirs. And you don't judge how to get through your stuff by what somebody else is doing. And these are just basic life lessons that we, it seems like we don't even have these conversations with our kids anymore. Yeah, we just right. don't even talk about it. For, uh, first of all, that was beautiful. Um, <laughs> that was, that was, that was beautifully said. Um, and, and people on my channel know I do these little rants, so I apologize. No, 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 I didn't no, warn you. No, no, no. That was great. No, that was beautiful. But They're I organic. Would, I swear. <laughs> no, no. I, yeah. I don't think you're reading it off the teleprompter there. And I would, I would double down on that and just kind of say it differently which is that, you know, there are a lot of human virtues that exist, right? And, and a lot of the ones that we talk about in schools today are good, right? Empathy is good. Compassion is good. Kindness is good. Charity is good. Um, but you know what else is good? Fortitude. Yes. Strength. Prodigiousness. Uh, temperance. The kinds of virtues that we used to talk about in the ancient world. And, and I think that those virtues uh, are, are should be balanced with these other virtues as well. Um, it's not it, it's an all of the above uh, is is what we should be doing. And I think what you said really well is that the things that are hard in life, those are the good things, right? It's the hard stuff that's worth doing. Nobody cares about the easy stuff. Uh, and yet, when we start to say that you should get a trophy, uh, that you should make the team no matter what, I think what we're teaching our children is that, the things that we should be striving for shouldn't be striven for. They should just be given. And yet I would tell you as somebody who, you know, I, I, one of the lessons I've learned the hard way, and I don't know how many of your listeners out there are aspiring writers. If you want to have really low self-esteem, go on the journey of being published, right? If you really want right. to get into the feeling of, of rejection constantly for a long period of time, uh, try and get a literary agent, try and get a big book published. I did it for 20 years. Um, yeah. And, you know, just a quick story is, you know, this was my dream. Hollowed out. I have it right here. This was my dream, is, is, was to write this book. This was my magnum opus. And it came out on August 3rd. And four weeks before that, my father was diagnosed with lung and brain cancer. Oh, my God. And in the middle of August, my daughter left for college. So I had these three things happen. At the same time, my, my dad was dying of cancer. My daughter was going away to college and I was doing all of this publicity for the book. I mean, I was getting up at two 30 in the morning for a five 30 show on the East coast. I was staying up till midnight, you know, talking on serious radio and I was having interviews and then I would get in the car and take my dad to a cancer treatment. And what I realized was that no matter how high you think you climb in the mountain, you can still grow and that the pain, the difficulty the arduousness of the journey, it does, it, it transforms you. It makes that, it worth the journey. That's what makes it worth the journey, you know? And, and so, you know, when I, after my dad passed away, I, I went into his room 
And um, I'm sorry. Um, when I went into his room, my book was by his bedside because he hadn't he hadn't read it. Um, and he'd seen me struggle to get an agent, and he saw me struggle to get a book contract. And and the one thing that really made him feel better um, when he was 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 fighting for his life was kind of seeing me finally do this thing I've been working for. And yet what's interesting is that in that moment, I thought that was my dream. I thought my, the dream of my book was to write this important book that everybody would read and it would change the country. And when it came to the moment, what I realized was I really wanted the book to make my dad feel better in the moment. And that was a kind of spiritual awakening that I had. And, and mm -hmm. you know, our souls are not fixed. They're plastic, right? Our beings are, are malleable. We can always grow. We can always get better. But we only do it by, by confronting the hard stuff. Right? right. And and, and right. I want young people to confront the hard stuff um, always and forever. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned confronting the hard stuff. I made a video last week where I talked about how kids are kids and they're not miniature adults. Yeah. And a lot of what they're asking the kids to do in school as far as deconstructing their identities and, you know, what are your pronouns and, you know, having these kinds of conversations is creating adult levels of discomfort in people who are brand new on this planet, you know, yeah. like confronting issues they shouldn't have to even think about their innocence is getting damaged and they, you can't ever get that back. While at the same time, again, it's a paradox, you know, like, hey, let's let, let's put adult levels of discomfort about the evil society in which you live on you when you're too young and ignorant to be able to really do anything about it or even question whether we're telling you the truth. But at the same time, we're going to like molly coddle you about your feelings and everything. And nobody should ever say an unkind word. And if you see something that makes you slightly uncomfortable personally, then that person needs to be punished or canceled or taken to the side. And then if everyone doesn't want to be your friend, then that's a problem that we need to deal with. Toxic boundaries, don't you know? It's so backwards. Yes, children should have certain age appropriate kinds of discomfort. That's what yeah. helps them build those strong, you know, emotional and intellectual muscles, that fortitude you talk about. We need as adults to figure out what is age appropriate and not shy away from high expectations and rigor in the classroom, because then we will have stronger adults someday when they grow up. But you don't put more rigor on the emotional burdens. Right. And I, that is backwards. Right. I think it's a really dangerous thing to do a few things. One please don't base your identity on immutable characteristics, oh. right? If you base your identity, not on your, 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 your morality and your actions, but on being something that you're born with, yeah. the problem is you can't change that. So, mm -hmm. you know, you should never base your sense of selfhood on that. Um, and I think that the second thing is, I think we now treat childhood, not as childhood, uh, but as really a warm up, and, you know, kind of an, or, you know, kind of a, an appetizer, for adulthood, and I, I think that that's wrong. And I think yep. that when, when adult when adults uh, pretend that children are just mini adults, that that's wrong. Uh, and, and I think that it's going to lead to all kinds of problems when it comes to how kids look at the relationships. I mean, if you want to impugn relationships and society and reading, teach everybody at a young age that always and forever people are out there to get you. And, oh, absolutely and if, right. And if you and if you they won't want to get out of bed. <laughs> they won't want to get out of it. And, and not yeah. only that, by the way, I, mean, I think when you start to go into society and instead of saying, you, know, you start to ascribe the worst intentions to every slight, right? Every bad experience, which isn't to say there aren't bad people out there saying and doing bad things. There are. But I think the right mentality is screw them. If they did mm -hmm. something bad to me, I'm not going to let that define me. Uh, I'm going to use my agency and my selfhood to overcome that, to define myself. Mm -hmm. Don't let right. others define me. I will define myself through the exercise of my liberty. And, and, and I think that we've really lost the majesty and the magic of that, as you beautifully articulated. Right. Well, I mean, we've been, we've, I don't want to keep you too long, but I did want to ask you as a final question. Sure. I said what I think we need to do in just general terms, but what do you think we need to do, we can do? I mean, as parents, as teachers, as Americans, what are the things that we can do? What, what's actionable here? Uh, a few things. Uh, and by the way, none of these things are trendy or chic or, you know, earth shaking. So or easy, most or, likely. <laughs> or, or, or thank you. They're not easy. Um, I right. would say really, I would distill it down to two things. Number one, the adults in our society have to start adulting again. And what does that mean for our children? That means you, we have got to put ourselves back into the moral, 
the professional, the educational, but most of all, the physical spaces of our young people. We have to model substantive adulthood for them. We have to show them this is what it, this is what it looks like to be a dad or a mom. This is what it looks like to be a good citizen. This is what it looks like to be a good friend. Um, again, one of the things about the pandemic is young people were by themselves all day, every day, and they weren't around adults. They don't know how to talk to adults. I mean, I, I remember in some of my research in the book, one of the reasons why young people don't like to go to football games is they say it's really awkward to have to talk to adults. It's really awkward to have to look. Like I have a lot of students now who won't look you in the eye. Um, and, right. and that's because as adults, we've removed ourselves from the space of our young people. The second thing I would say, because I know we're at the end here, is we need to stop giving car keys before the kids have the license. And what I mean by that is if you give liberty and freedom to young people before you've imbued wisdom and virtue, they're not going to know how to drive the car of their lives, right? They will use their liberty and they won't use it to find meaning. They'll use it to engage in licentiousness, right? They will use their freedom for themselves rather than connecting to something bigger than themselves. And, and don't blame them. They didn't ask for this. They didn't ask to go through 18 months of a pandemic. They didn't ask to live in a time period where they're encouraged to live online with these dang phones all the time. They didn't right. ask to, to live in a degenerate, vulgar, violent culture. They didn't ask yeah. to be born in a period where politics is tribal, as you said. So mm -hmm. we adults, we have got to fix it. We have got to take the wheel back. And if we don't, not shame on them, shame on us. Do you think we can do it in our, this, if, if, because I've been saying if we have to do it as individuals, even if everybody around us isn't doing it. Yes. And I, and, and I'll tell you, and I hope this doesn't sound self-serving, but you know, they're like two layers of hopes for a book. The first hope is the kind of, it becomes an inter international bestseller and it changes the country, <laughs> right? It's should. The, everybody should read it. Go get yeah, it. Right yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Go read it. Uh, but, but the second tier though, it, it, which I'm, I'm seeing a lot of in the last few months is everybody, you know, I see all these studies coming out kind of confirming what I've been talking about. You have the Surgeon General talking about this epidemic of loneliness. You have people coming up talking about the evils of social media and the mental health of our children. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you see all of these things about, about young people not wanting to have families, about our birth rate in free fall, about how people don't have friends. Um, I mean, you're seeing all these things that I wrote about in Hollowed Out and you know, people who didn't read the book saying, well, it's just, you know, an, an angry old man howling into the wind and pushing up against the ocean. No, these things are real. They're out there. And I think we're finally starting to say we have a profound problem in this culture with our young people. It's not their fault. We've got to do something about it. And you're, I mean, the evidence is everywhere. And like you said before, yeah. eventually the truth, capital T, I'm not a relativist, the real truth is going to come out. And I think we're confronting it now. And we're kind of in, we're in the birth pangs of it, but it's there. Yep. And like you, because you said in the book, you're an optimist. I'm still an optimist. I still feel like we can we can save it all. Um, but we have to first accept the, the situation we're in and stop pretending it's going to be solved by the next election or it's going to be it's just if things work out, you know, yeah. no, no, it's it, it, it's going to be a, messy. But it, I think we can we it's can a do it's so. a it's a generational project. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and there's no quick fixes and it's no. not going to happen overnight. Um, mm -hmm. But but I do think at the end of the day, I do think love of country and love of our children uh, and the fact that adults do know we do know what a good life is. And eventually that will shine out as well, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for coming and talking to us. And thank you for this wonderful book. Please, everybody go get hollowed out. All right. It's a quick read. It really is, you know, you'll, you won't be able to put it down because you're going to be reading it going, uh-huh. Mm -hmm, yep. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. it, it, but he puts things so well that it's just like, uh, there were so many parts I wanted to read out loud, but um, everybody else should go read the book. And um, I thank everybody today for listening. Please share this video. Please like share, you know, send it to other parents. Everybody needs to get this message. And, um, I will see you next time. And um, if you stick around after the broadcast, after we sign out, we'll I'll get you the, a copy of this or two, okay? All right, thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon.